welcome to Perspectives on Islam from a non-Muslim. My name is Elaine, and the subject today is Islam and the Unbelievers, Christians, Jews, and Others. And we'll start at the end, more or less. Muhammad on his deathbed gave three orders saying, expel the pagans from the Arabian Peninsula, respect and give gifts to the foreign delegates, as you, as you have seen me dealing with them. And then the Jews and Christians were expelled from the Arabian Peninsula. So the question is now, who are the pagans? Because because quite often Christians and Jews are described as people of the book and think they have a special relationship with Islam. And this book here, The Sources of Islam, a uh, Persian treatise, uh, speaks about this and explains that within the Islamic foundational doctrine, there are subjects uh, taken from Judaism, various Christian sects, but also Zoroastrian, Sabaean, Egyptian, and Hindu traditions, as well as Arabian customs that have been maintained in Islam. Now, within um, these, we find the Bridge of Surat, uh, the Ascent to the Seven Heavens, the Huris fasting, and five of the prayer times matching those of the Sabaeans, uh, the um, uh, circling of the Kaaba, kissing the black stone uh, from the Arabian tribes. And as for Judaism and Christianity, there are significant differences, and we'll touch on a few of them in this presentation. Uh, the Persians, Jews, and Christians were plentiful in the Arabian Peninsula, but also polytheists and others. Um, Mecca itself was a polytheistic society. So exactly who are the pagans? And uh, uh, the uh, foundational belief of Islam says there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And anyone who does not believe that is an unbeliever. And it doesn't matter, Christian, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, Zoroastrian, atheist, agnostic, if they do not accept this, then it's called the Shahada, then they are an unbeliever. So the authority of the Quran and Muhammad are very similar. In the Quran, it says, he who obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah, and that there has been in the messenger of Allah, meaning Muhammad, an excellent pattern for anyone whose hope is in Allah and the last day. So we'll have a quick look at the foundational doc uh, doctrine here. You're familiar with the Quran, uh, the Hadith. These are the stories and traditions about Muhammad. Very significant. This is foundational doctrine from which, you know, fatwas, etc. The uh, best sources are the Quran and Hadith, Sahih Hadith, the good ones. And there's also the Sirah. This one is Ibn Ishaq, and it dates back to the 8th century. And this is a good one to look at because it's... Um, uh, it, it's very detailed uh, is story of Muhammad's life, and that gives us context. Now, this is my Quran. Uh, the reason for having a look at this, of course, is because so much of the Islamic doctrine is actually about the unbeliever, a significant amount. And uh, what you see here, the yellow is from Mecca, the turquoise is from Medina, and in my Quran, it's fully 64% of the doctrine. Now, what we were just looking at is actually all of the foundational doctrine, but that's a lot to go through. So there are handbooks of Sharia, and here's an example. This is Reliance of the Traveler. So the Quran and Sunnah together are the ordained way of Islam. Uh, the whole thing is a Sharia the way people are supposed to behave, what they're supposed to do, but there are handbooks to make it a bit easier. And here's an example from the handbook. Jihad means to war against non-Muslims. Fighting is prescribed for you. Fight the idolaters utterly. And Hadith, such as, I have been commanded to fight the people till they testify there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is the messenger. Perform prayer and pay the cat. And the hadith that is reported, it is better to fight in the path of Allah than the whole world and everything in it. So from the early days in Mecca, 
Muhammad started having visions when he was 40. He thought he might be going mad, a poet, or con contemplated suicide. So his wife's cousin was called, and he said that Muhammad must be a prophet. So this was kept kind of quiet at first. The people joining him were mostly family and friends. Three years elapsed, and then God said to Muhammad, proclaim what you have been ordered and turn aside the polytheists. Uh, warn your family, thy nearest relations, and lower thy wing to the followers who follow thee. And say, I am the one who warns plainly, and warn he did. Now this is Ibn Ishaq. This is the life of Muhammad we were looking at earlier from the 8th century. Now the Meccans wanted compromise, and uh, Muhammad was having none of it. And this prayer, many of you may have heard, actually, it is a prayer that is said 17 times a day by uh, a, um, devout uh, followers of Islam. And in it, it says that they are to be guided the straight way, not the way of those who earned their anger, such as the Jews, nor those who went astray, such as the Christians. It's said in Arabic. And I've been to what are called Dawa dialogue events, where uh, someone uh, from a Christian tradition will maybe say the Lord's Prayer, and then it will be followed by this verse in Arabic. And the people there uh, quite often don't really understand what is being said. So early on there in Mecca, uh, Muhammad and his revelations were often challenged. Uh, he was accused of being a madman. Um, and so Muhammad said he had a revelation. And it's from Allah. Allah is saying, you are not uh, a madman, for you will be an endless reward. Uh, you have an exalted standard of character. You will see, they will see, which of you is afflicted with madness. And from the Quran, we know that the polytheists and pagans say, it is only a human being who teaches Muhammad. The Quran frequently refers to the personal uh, events in um, Muhammad's life. Now, for example, this is in the Quran, but this is Muhammad's uncle. May the hands of Abu Lahab be ruined. His wealth will not avail him. He will burn in a fire of blazing flame. His wife as well, the carrier of firewood, and around her neck is a rope of twisted fiber. Now, as you can imagine, the people in Mecca didn't like hearing these kind of warnings. They didn't appreciate it. His uncle didn't appreciate it. His uncle was refusing to follow Islam, and this verse came down uh, in the Quran. And there was a, a Persian uh, fellow who used to say, well, um, I've been to Mesopotamia. I know the stories there, and I can tell a better story than Muhammad. And he began to tell stories. And he said, in what respect is Muhammad a better storyteller than I? And a companion of Muhammad, Ibn Abbas here, said that there were eight verses of the Quran that came down in reference to this one man. Muhammad's warnings uh, were often ominous. Uh, when, uh, uh, for instance, this man we were just speaking of here, in the Quran, it says, he says tales of the men of old, while we will brand him over the nose. And again, leave me alone with such as belie this Quran. We shall punish them gradually from directions they perceive not. I will grant them a respite. My plan is strong. Muhammad said that his coming was foretold. And here's an example of that, uh, that those who follow uh, Muhammad uh, they, um, they find uh, written in the Torah and gospel uh, what enjoins upon them what is right and wrong, in other words, Sharia. And in this, he's actually referring to the Torah of the Jews, and this is Deuteronomy 18.15, and for the Christians, the gospel, John 14.16. Uh, and according to the Quran, this is actually supposed to be about Muhammad and the Jews and Christians changed the words that were sent down. So those who wronged among them changed the words to a statement other than that which had been sent to them. So 
quite often there are references in the Quran of the uh, people of the book changing the scriptures they were given because according to the Quran, all of the prophets from Abraham on down, they were all uh, Muslim and they were all given the correct message, but those words have been changed. So the challenges continue. For example, here in the Quran, it says, uh, Mary, sister of Aaron. Now this is referring to Mary, mother of Jesus, but sister of Aaron, well, there was over 1,500 years between Aaron uh, and, and Mary. So this is, um, this is, of course, questioned. And uh, Jesus said, Indeed, I am the servant of Allah. He has given me scripture and made me a prophet. He has made me blessed and has enjoined on me prayer and zakat as long as I live. Now, the Christian uh, Gospels do not say that Jesus spoke when he was in the cradle or that he said that zakat should be paid to him. Uh, I should say that zakat in Islam it has eight categories, and one of the categories is jihad. And uh, Jesus did not... Uh, was not involved in any battles, uh, any jihad, and certainly didn't collect um, charity for that purpose. So it says, whatever you give in interest uh, will not increase with Allah, but what do you give in zakat? These and the multipliers. So this is conflating business, which is interest, oh, with uh, charity, um, which is it actually also finances jihad. And here it is from the Quran. The zakat is for the poor, yes, and for those who collect the funds to attract the hearts of those who are inclined towards Islam, to free captives, those in debt, but also for Allah's cause, the mujahideen, those fighting in the holy wars. So the migration to uh, Medina is very significant. This is the beginning of the Islamic calendar. It occurred in 622. And uh, what had happened is Muhammad had lost his wife Khadija and the one uncle who, um, Uncle uh, Abu Talib, who protected him in Islam from the people who were not happy with what he was saying and, and would rather that uh, Muhammad would stop or leave. So he lost those two people, and he did leave. He migrated to Medina. He took he had at that point about 150 followers. Now in Medina, there were three tribes of Jews, approximately half the population at that time. Muhammad still believed that the Jews uh, would probably accept him as a prophet, but they did not. And Muhammad became a military leader and a politician. He began with jihad raids on the Meccan caravans, uh, the Battle of Badr is particularly important, and we'll speak about that later. And the first mosque uh, was built in Medina, and it was used as a court for trials, verdicts, decrees, a place to carry out a sentence, um, a war chamber, storage for weapons, receiving foreign delegations used as a prison, for war captives. And sorry, here's all of the references here. And in Medina, though, the doubts continued and uh, there were questions about his revelations and the things that Muhammad was saying. So uh, from the Quran, we have, do not set up rivals to Allah while you know that he alone has the right to be worshiped. And if you, Arab pagans, Jews, and Christians are in doubt about the Quran and Muhammad, then produce a chapter like it. If you do not, then fear the fire of uh, hell, whose fuel is men and stone prepared for the disbelievers. So it's continuing. The people are being warned that they need to follow Islam, or there will be dire consequences. So there's more disbelief and dualism. Um, Muhammad uh, is still being uh, questioned and about changing the uh, words of the of the other scriptures. And so he 
sometimes he'll say one thing and another time it'll be a bit different. And so people are questioning him on that as well. And so it comes down in the Quran that when we change a verse of the Quran in place of another, the disbelievers say, well, you are just a liar. But whenever a verse of revelation we cause to be forgotten or abrogated, we bring a better one or a similar one to it. So this is uh, very important to recognize that the later verses in uh, Islam that came after the migration to Medina um, are the ones that are considered the better, stronger verses. But they also signify a significant change in tactics because that's when jihad was adopted. The religion in the sight of Allah is Islam. Whoever disbelieves in these verses, Allah is swift in taking account. And the because the Quran is not in chronological order, it's sometimes very difficult for people to follow, but I'm doing my best here to put these in order uh, so that they go from Mecca to Medina, and you can see how they parallel Muhammad's life. So the Jews and Christians are again accused of corrupting their script scriptures. Woe be to those who write the scripture with their hands and then say, this is from Allah. There is among them a party who alter the scriptures with their tongues. So you think it's from the scripture, but it is not. And they speak untruth. So this is both writing and speaking. And Muhammad, at this point, the Jews were not accepting him. He turned his direction of prayer from Jerusalem to Mecca. And the Jews and Christians did not turn. So you can see here, we shall turn you to a Qibla prayer direction at Mecca. And the Jews and Christians know well your turning towards the direction of uh, Kaaba at Mecca is the truth from their Lord. Allah is not unaware of what they do. And even if you were to bring to the people of the scriptures, the Jews and Christians, all the proof, they would not follow your prayer direction. So the Jews and Christians maintain their prayers towards Jerusalem while Muhammad turned towards Mecca. After the migration, which is called the Hijra, the Jews and Christians uh, were not supposed to be befriended. There's actually 13 verses in the Quran stating that Jews and Christians should not be, or unbelievers, should not be taken as friends. And they all occur after the migration to Medina. Some Muslims remain friends with the Jews. This is from the life of Muhammad. Uh, that I showed you at the beginning. Some Muslims remain friends with the Jews because ties of mutual protection and alliance. So Allah sent down concerning them and forbidding them to take them as intimate friends. Here's an example. O you who believe, take not as your helpers and friends those outside your religion, the pagans, Jews, Christians, and hypocrites. They will not fail to do their best to corrupt you. They desire to harm you severely. This is what Muhammad told them. Uh, Muhammad was at this time obtaining loans from the Jews, and one of his colleagues, uh, companions, Abu Bakr, went into a Jewish school and found a number of men around one of the uh, rabbis. And Abu Bakr called on him and said to fear God and become a Muslim, and that they would find this written in the Torah and the gospel that Muhammad was the apostle. While the Jews responded with, if, if he was independent of us, he would not ask us to lend him our money, as your master pretends, prohibiting you to take interest and allowing us to. Had he been independent of us, he would not give us interest. So money plays a significant role here. Uh, it is also collected through zakat. And zakat, I've already showed you there, is the charity. It's an Islamic tax that is uh, collected. It is one of the pillars of Islam. It's supposed to be two and a half percent of the income. And uh, what it says is uh, those who uh, um, spend out of what we have provided them, uh, out of what we have provided for them, gives a cat. And those who believe do this. And uh, 
Uh, they pay zakat and uh, they also pay for uh, Allah's cause, jihad. And Allah uh, destroys interest and gives increase for zakat. This is from the Quran, and this, of course, includes jihad. And that was very important, the jihad, because Muhammad acquired money by raiding caravans and in loans. So fight in the cause of Allah. Who is he that will loan to Allah a beautiful loan, which Allah will double to his credit and multiply many times? Now, this is what's called the tafsir of the Quran. And this one is uh, by Ibn Kathir. And Ibn Kathir was uh, around the 14th century. And it's what it is, is a commentary. Just to make sure that you understand what's being said in the Quran, uh, you can go to a commentary and review it there. And this is very clear. The commentary says, yes, in this verse, Allah encourages his servants to spend in his cause. And that this is mentioned several times in the Quran, which it is. So one of the early battles, 624, so it was two years after the migration, was the Battle of Badr. And uh, we'll speak about the Battle of Badr again later because the uh, followers of Muhammad were greatly outnumbered, but nevertheless, they won. And there was a bit of an argument over the spoils of war. And as a result, Muhammad went away and thought about it and had a revelation and this is it. The whole chapter eight of the Quran is called the spoils of war. It's about the spoils of war. And the first uh, verse says, they ask you about the spoils of war. Say the spoils are for Allah and the messenger. So obey Allah and his messenger if you are believers. And typically 20% uh, would be, a fifth of it would be for Muhammad uh, and Allah and the rest would be divided amongst the followers if there was a battle. If there was no battle, then it would all be for Muhammad and Allah to distribute as he saw fit. So I got very curious about this because the mention of booty and spoils of war comes up so frequently that I just did a quick review of those three sources I showed you at the beginning. Uh, the Life of Muhammad by Ibn Ishaq. Uh, the collection of Hadith by Bukhari, only Bukhari, and the Quran. And there are 425 references just using those two terms. Well, when the battle was over, uh, came down in the Quran that it was not Muhammad's followers who killed the, um, uh, the Meccans who fought there. It was actually Allah who killed them. And in the Quran, it also says that those who spread, if the hypocrites and those who spread uh, rumors in Medina do not stop, we will incite you against them and they will not remain your neighbors except for a little. Accursed where they are found, being seized and massacred completely. So that is the wrong religion. The right religion would be. Um, they're commanded that they should worship Allah, abstaining from ascribing partners to him because that Christians uh, say that uh, Jesus is part of a trinity is considered uh, shirk. It's, um, it's haram, a very bad thing. So they were commanded uh, that they are not supposed to do that and they are supposed to give zakat and that is the right religion. So Islam is considered the right religion and those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, and Muhammad, from among the people of the scriptures, the Jews, Christians, also the al mushrikan or the polytheists, will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. So jihad is often cited as the best deed, and booty includes money, property, ransom, women, and slaves. And that could be gold, silver, baskets of dates, all kinds of things. So uh, here we have from the Hadith of Muhammad, who is the best of the people? Allah's messenger, Muhammad replied, a believer who strives his utmost in Allah's cause with his life and his property. And of course, that's also in the Quran. There are certainly among you those who would linger behind from fighting in Allah's cause. But if 
a bounty, victory, and booty comes, he will surely say, I wish I had been with them, and then I would have achieved a good share of booty. Well, the second tribe was expelled from Medina. And as you saw at the beginning, eventually all three of those tribes were within five years expelled or killed in Medina. There were no Jews left. And so here we have in the Quran uh, that uh, it is uh, he who expelled the ones who disbelieve. So it's Allah who did this. And they thought their fortresses would protect them. But he cast terror into their hearts. And if not that Allah had decreed for them evacuation, he would have punished them in this world. So it's all Allah who was doing this, not Muhammad and his followers. Because they opposed Allah and his messenger, and whoever opposes Allah, indeed, Allah is severe in penalty. He will disgrace the defiantly disobedient. And what Allah restored of property to his messenger, what came to Muhammad, um, you did not do it in an expedition, but Allah gives his messengers power over whom he will. He will. So uh, here we have again the expulsion of the, the Jews from the Hijaz, that's from Arabia. And the uh, Banu Nadir, were expelled. The Quraysa were allowed to stay uh, for a while. And then eventually in the Battle of the Trench, they were all killed. The, the men were killed. The women were taken as booty. And the messenger uh, uh, turned out all the Jews in Medina, every Jew. Some uh, were granted security, those who embraced Islam, as you can see in this one. When we were in the mosque, Muhammad came out and said, let us go to the Jews. He said, if you embrace Islam, you will be safe. You should know the earth belongs to Allah and his apostle, Muhammad. And I want to expel you from this land. You should know that the earth belongs to Allah and Muhammad. So later, uh, some of the Jews that had left uh, Medina earlier had gone to uh, Kaibar. It was uh, another... Uh, village um, a distance away and a bit of an oasis. So Muhammad later went there and fought against them. Muhammad actually fought with all of his neighbors. So they reached Kaibar at night and when it was morning and the Jews came out with their spades and baskets to go to work, uh, they saw Muhammad and his army and Muhammad said, Kaibar is destroyed. For whenever we approach a nation to fight, then evil will be the mourning for those who have been warned. And of course, the Jews had been warned that they should accept Islam. And from the uh, life of Muhammad ibn Ishaq, when the apostle had finished with Kaibar, God struck terror into the hearts of the men of Fadak when they heard about uh, what had happened to the men at Kaibar. And so they offered peace in the same way. Now, what happened in both of these places was a few were killed at Kaibar, but not all of them. They asked if they could please stay there and they would work the land and pay tribute to Muhammad. And that is what happened for a while. They were eventually all expelled, but for quite a while uh, they paid tribute and this, it was 50% approximately of what they managed to uh, grow on the land. So these are called dhimmis, second-class citizens, and they pay tribute in order to have their lives spared. Um, and that tribute is called jizya. So had Muhammad continued with only preaching and no uh, jihad, we can extrapolate there would have been 265 believers at the time of Muhammad's death, because you can see here, in the first 13 years, 150 people. But in the next 10, it's up to 100,000. So that's how that happened. And eventually Muhammad returned to Mecca and conquered Mecca as well. And here it is now. Um, some people think that conquering Mecca was a fairly, um, was not a really violent affair. And 
Um, you, you could argue that it wasn't extremely violent, not too many were killed because they submitted. By then, the reputation of Muhammad and his followers uh, all across the peninsula was, um, was one that, uh, I'll, I'll just read it to you here. When the apostle passed with his greenish black squadron, whose eyes alone were visible because of their armor, a man there asked, who are they? And uh, he was told that none could withstand that, him and that it was due to his prophetic office. So Muhammad had instructed his commanders to only fight those who resisted, except a small number who were to be killed, even if they were found beneath the curtain of the Kaaba. And among them was Abdullah bin Sa'd. And the reason he ordered him to be killed was that he had been a Muslim. And he used to write down the revelations. But then he apostatized and returned to the Quraysh. And Muhammad uh, ordered two singing girls, Fartana and her friend, who used to sing satirical songs about him. Uh, he ordered that they would be killed. And another one uh, who was ordered to be killed used to insult Muhammad in Mecca. And another was a, um, a man, Mikyas, who had killed an Ansari who had killed his brother accidentally. Now that battle had, uh, that argument had started before the time of Islam. But he had uh, returned to Quraysh as a polytheist. And uh, also Sarah, who was a freed slave, she had uh, insulted Muhammad in Mecca. And, you know, I encourage you at any time to uh, stop these slides and read the doctrine yourself more carefully. So, as I mentioned earlier, Mecca was a polytheistic society and had 360 idols, while when Mecca was con uh, conquered, all 360 idols, with the exception there was one there of Jesus and Mary, and that was, uh, that was not destroyed because uh, Jesus is considered one of the former prophets, although the stories about him in Islam are quite different. And Islamic armies continued to fight more battles. And he, what, uh, what Muhammad said, and this is from a hadith uh, about him, that there is no migration after the conquest. The prophet said on the day of the conquest of Mecca, there is no migration after the conquest, but jihad and good intentions. And when you are called for jihad, you should immediately respond. So Islam actually means submission. And as you can see, there, there are many battles. There are many more than you see here. Uh, we'll get to that. And it says in the Quran, when the sacred months have passed, kill the polytheists wherever you find them, capture them and besiege them. Sit and wait for them at every place of ambush. And if they should repent, give the cat, let them go. And, you know, I just want to say that, you know, as I showed you at the beginning, so much of the doctrine is about the unbeliever. It was quite difficult, actually, to narrow down the material for this presentation because there's so much of it. It's not that I am trying to... Uh, you know, put a certain slant on this. I just want to present things that are not always spoken of and perhaps should be more often. In a nine-year period, Muhammad personally took part in 27 raids. There were 38 other battles and expeditions, and this is a total of 65 armed events, not including assassinations and executions, for an average of one armed event every six weeks. Never be a helper to the unbelievers. Fight against those who believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger. That means Sharia. And those who acknowledge not Islam among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, until they pay jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So this is a special treatment for people of the book. It was later extended to Hindus uh, that... They, if they are conquered, they may be allowed to uh, stay or uh, live so long as they pay the jizya and follow the rules. 
O you who believe, fight those of the disbelievers who are near to you and let them find harshness in you. So we're going to look a little bit at past and present now. So the Islamic doctrine uh, is taken very seriously. This is um, from the Hadith of Muhammad. And we've heard this a lot on our streets lately, actually. Fighting for the cause of jihad. And uh, Muhammad said, the hour will not be established until you fight with the Jews. And the stone behind which a Jew will be hiding will say, O oh Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me, so kill him. And here we have the Hamas charter. And uh, the Hamas are in Israel. And they have in their charter, the Islamic resistance movement aspires to the realization of Allah's promise. Muhammad said the day of judgment will not come about until the Muslims fight the Jews, killing them. And the stones and trees will say, oh, Muslims, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. Christmas is uh, sometimes um, a bit difficult with Islam. There are some uh, who say that it, Christmas is an insult to Allah. Here is an example, uh, and I've seen many such like this. What the Quran says is people of the scripture uh, do not say about Allah anything except the truth. That Jesus was but a messenger of Allah. Uh, do not say three, desist, it is better for you. And that's what the issue is, is that Christians and Christmas say that um, Jesus is the son of God. And this is considered haram, very bad and an insult to Allah. So past and present again, in uh, um, Medina, Muhammad said, had only 10 Jews amongst the chiefs, believe me. So this is the power of influence that all Jews would have believed him. There's another hadith like this one saying, if only 10 scholars of the Jews had believed in him, they would all have believed him. And here we have in Montreal, this is 2017, a few years ago, an imam calling for the Jews to be killed in a sermon at a mosque there. Now, here's an interesting little hadith, just a, a little one, um, but it's an example. The bell, which is how Christians often uh, call, are called to prayer, is the musical instrument of Satan. And here we have a very recent event. This is only last month, 2024. Uh, raiders kill at least a dozen worshipers at Burkina Faso Church in Africa. And it's blamed on the jihadi group. At least 15 people were killed in an attack, a jihadi attack on a Catholic church during a Sunday mass. So... What does Sharia have to say about this? Because we hear about the golden rule. Now, this that doesn't sound like the golden rule. So here's an example from Sharia in the handbook I showed you at the beginning. Reliance of the traveler, the judge, handles cases on a first-come, first-served basis. And he treats them the same, seating both in places of equal honor, unless one is a non-Muslim, in which case he gives the Muslim a better seat. And here from the Hadith of Muhammad, the prohibition of initiating a greeting with the people of the book and how to respond to them. Muhammad said, do not greet the Jews and Christians before they greet you. And when you meet any one of them on the road, force him to the narrowest part of it. And the Quran says, you are the best nation as an example for mankind. You enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. This is the Sharia. And if only the people of the scripture had believed, it would have been better for them. So again, the golden rule of Islam, what it actually says is, the prophet said, none of you will have faith till he wishes for his Muslim brother, what he likes for himself. So it's not the same for everyone. I did not put this in here. This is right out of the book. And everything of a Muslim is sacred to a Muslim, his property brought blood and honor. And again, from the uh, 
Sharia, Reliance of the Traveler. Legal testimony is only acceptable from a witness who is religious, meaning upright and Muslim. And from the Quran, let those of rectitude among you testify. And unbelief is the vilest form of corruption, as goes without saying. Here's another one people have often heard uh, said in connection with Islam. Whoever kills a human being, it shall be as if he killed all mankind. And who saves the life of one, it's as if he saved the life of all mankind. But when you read the whole thing, you'll see that actually this is referring to the story of Cain and Abel. And it's uh, a little different in the Quran, but actually fairly close this one. It says... Um, that Allah sent a raven to show him how to hide his brother's corpse. This is Cain and Abel. For that cause, we do, for that cause, we decreed for the children of Israel that whoever kills a human being, it shall be as if he killed all mine, all mankind. And whoever saves the life of one, it shall be as if he saved the life of all mankind. So this is specifically for the Jewish people. And the only reward of those who make war on Allah and Muhammad, who, you know, reject him as the Jews did, and strive after corruption in the land, will be that they will be killed or crucified or have their hands and feet on alternate sides cut off or will be expelled out of the land. So here are the military jihad battles from 620 to 1920. Because we often hear about the Crusades, they were defensive. So I just wanted to show this because we often hear, oh, well, we've done as much or, you know, the Christians have done as much. They had the Crusades and true, they were terrible. People did not know what they were doing uh, and huge mistakes were made. But nevertheless, the Crusades are the black ones and the Jihad are the gray ones. So you can see that they were called by the Pope to try and come and help. The uh, uh, formerly Christian Jewish Buddhist Zoroastrian um, polytheistic societies that were being taken over by Islam. So the end times are foretold in Islamic doctrine. And it says the hour will not be established until the son of Mary, Jesus, descends among you and he will break the cross and kill the bigs and abolish the jizya which means you will not be able to pr play, pray, play, pay, <laughs> pay the jizya, protection money anymore. Uh, the only thing that will be accepted is Islam. And uh, it also says in the Hadith, the acceptance of repentance of the one who kills, even if he has killed a great deal. So if a follower of Islam repents at at his uh, at the last day, that Allah will accept a Jew or Christian in his stead and say that is your rescue from hellfire. So back in uh, 2006, there was a letter sent by uh, 38 uh, Islamic religious leaders to the Pope and it's called a common word. And they were wanting to establish dialogue. And it's interesting to note that this was sent at the time of Ramadan. And uh, this coincides with Islam's triumph over Mecca and the Battle of Badr. So uh, dialogue has been going on since then and Dawah events. And this is mission evangelizing on the part of Islam. And yet, over the last three decades, persecution has grown and intensified in Africa, mainly due to the rise of the jihadi movement. And here's uh, just a picture from the, uh, the video. The uh, link for it is there in the description. So when you look at what is happening with these dialogues, it's quite confusing. Now, here's an example. This is a Christian Educators Academy. And this person uh, taught at a Christian high school and says, discover the art of giving dawah to Christians. Welcome to our comprehensive guide on how to give Islamic mission to Christians. And that is certainly happening. Um, in this guide, we will help you explore the common ground 
like that letter to the Pope, the common word. But it says here, as Muslims, uh, we have a responsibility to share the beauty of Islam. So it's a little confusing whether this is Christian or this is Muslim. And in uh, British Columbia, Canadian province, they have a refugee sponsorship program. And you think of all of those people coming from Africa. Well, um, the, uh, provincial the provincial coordinator, program coordinator for the Anglican and Catholic diocese who have a joint program is actually a follower of Islam. Now, here is a website, it's called Religion of Peace, and they've been keeping track of the um, jihad attacks since 911. And this is only one tenth of the list for the last 30 days. And one of the victims on this list is a Hindu man who was beaten to death because his restaurant was open uh, during Ramadan. So um, I hope you've uh, found this presentation to be very interesting. And perhaps it's time to redefine the concept of religion such that at a minimum, all life is valued and none more than others. I thank you for your attention. Please like, share, and subscribe. There's links below. Thank you.